So welcome to the All Things Crypto panel. It's the last panel session of the day, and so I hope uh, it's going to be the best one. Um, we are going to cover a wide array of topics, and we have a very uh, diverse panel with interesting backgrounds all around. So we're going to do quick 30-second intros, uh, and then we're going to dive right into it. So do you want to start us off, Jenny? Sure. Um, in the booklet, if you guys have the booklet, um, I'm actually Cynthia for today, but I'm not Cynthia. They reverse our uh, our picture. My bio is under Cynthia's picture, and her bio is under mine. So um, I'm a serial entrepreneur. Founded uh, two Wall Street broker dealers. Both have been acquired. Uh, launched my third uh, company, uh, which is a tech firm, and my fourth company, which is a uh, venture capital firm, Angel Investing and stuff. I flew here from LA. So I, I met Tin, uh, the chair, at South by Southwest. I was speaking there, uh, and he saw me, um, uh, you know, my panel, and he invited me, and I uh, took him on. So here I am. Thank you for having me. Glad to have you. Uh, my name is Akeem Sawyer. I have been in the global payment space for the last seven years, primarily focused on Africa. So I um, was one of the early investors in a mobile payments company in Sierra Leone called Splash Mobile Money. When mobile money was just sort of beginning in Africa with M-Pesa um, and sort of watched the digital payment space, so to speak, evolve in Africa. Now I am running a startup that's focused on remittances um, because I think that's one of the larger problems that's yet to be solved and I think blockchain has a particular um, benefit when you look at remittances into emerging markets. Hello, my name is Paul McNeil, also known as the Crypto Curator. Uh, I'm with uh, Crypto Market 360. Uh, I basically, most of you in this room probably get your news information or get your information some kind of way. You either have your particular publication or your particular feeds that you look at to get information about the crypto space. Um, what we do is we curate news information, um, what we consider a 360 degree look of the market every day, Monday through Friday, and we send out a news brief uh, so that everyone, all of our subscribers can at least get a quick read of what's going on without having to read all the articles. Uh, my background is I come from the media curation space. <laughs> I helped build a company that we grew for about almost nine years, uh, providing services to Capitol Hill and Fortune 500 companies with the media curation space. My name is Josh Bowles. Uh, my background mainly in real estate and I've gotten into this space in the past year. Uh, it's a very fascinating space. Uh, primarily at this point advise and work with different groups uh, in a variety of capacities. Uh, the main goal that I have and that the people I work with I have, uh, we build long-term relationships. So really 20 plus year relationships are what we look for. And then we are able to move at the speed of trust and uh, find this whole space in the way that it's moving. And the trust factor, a very interesting one. Uh, and I see a lot of interesting blockchain solutions are being built and so at this point I, I help people make uh, hay out of uh, the blockchain space so that they can understand a lot of the nuances uh, as I get to see a lot of different uh, aspects of blockchain and so uh, great to be here and excited to get this start uh, awesome. panel started. So yeah so we have you know a diverse set of sectors represented on this panel real estate, remittances, social media and you know Ethereum has definitely established itself as the leading uh, smart contract platform with all these ICOs elect electing to choose or to launch on Ethereum. Um, one thing I'll, we, I definitely want to do on this panel is making sure we are touching on you know practical use cases for, uh, for smart contracts and a lot of these different platforms that are being launched. Um, and so I'd love to just open up to the panel to maybe discuss in, in your industries or interesting applications that you see of um, of you know smart contract platforms. Does yeah, you know, up to the panel. Well, it, as it relates to smart contracts, uh, I see people kind of searching for different solutions. Uh, there's a flagship asset in New York right now uh, that a family office is uh, in the process of acquiring, and in the capital formation process, uh, they're carving out a piece to tokenize that piece, and it's uh, interesting to uh, watch them go through and see what. Uh, technologies they think make sense and why, 
because all this is very new, so you're not really able to go look at a whole bunch of case studies. And so there's, there's a, a, that trust factor with the technology and then how the market's going to react and are you going to be able to create the, uh, the value that you want out of it. And so I think that's a big question that's in a lot of people's minds right now as uh, they put together these uh, asset-backed crypto type transactions. Yeah, so, I mean, I work a lot in emerging markets, um, and lots of markets where the legal framework and enforceability of contracts is actually very weak. Um, so I think platforms that allow um, two counterparties to actually transact in a way where if I fulfill my end of the contract, payment is guaranteed, I think there's a massive benefit there because in most emerging markets, most transactions happen essentially peer-to-peer, -peer, right? You don't really have robust legal systems or, you know, a lot of participants that want to pay legal fees or pay intermediaries. And so the cost of transactions can be really high, right, if I don't trust the counterparty. So, I mean, I think the great benefit of smart contracts is you can have a platform or a system that guarantees to some extent that both ends have the value that they're trying to transact with, right? So think about like an escrow system. If I provide a service, that should be an automatic system that pays. But in order for me to transact with you, I have to know you actually have that value, right? And so that's where the underlying currencies become a huge benefit because you have a platform like Ethereum, you have a smart contracts, but you have the underlying currency. All of a sudden, you know, different peers can transact if they meet the rules and requirements of the system. So I think in emerging markets, there's a huge benefit to smart contracts because it's actually creating a marketplace that really doesn't exist today um, in any sort of large quantum. And if you, think the, if you think about the cost of counterparty risk in any transaction, I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why lawyers get paid a lot of money. Mm -hmm. It can be extremely high in certain circumstances. Um, now, to the question you raised about, I guess, Ethereum, I think it's, it's the idea of like first mover and the network effect. I think the more participants you have in the marketplace that are transacting, the more liquidity you have, it's developer friendly. So the market will migrate there, right? And I think it'll be, um, generally there's a huge switching cost, right? I think it's sort of like, when I think about how the internet evolved, right? You have one Amazon, maybe a few other sizable competitors in a niche space, but I think you're gonna like migrate to having a few winners that become the Uber platforms that continue to absorb most of the market activity. You know, speaking of that, what I found being interesting, being a curator, looking at the news every day, <clears throat> and I was just speaking uh, to him just a second ago about it, is most smart contracting came about by Ethereum. Ethereum was the first to launch the platform so you can do that. But what most people are not realizing is that there are so many platforms that exist today where people are starting to launch. Um, with my company, I do live reports. We did a live report with Stellar, and I was shocked to find out how many companies are actually launching platforms, uh, uh, launching companies on the Stellar platform. That was one that I didn't even recognize was a platform for smart contracting. In addition to that, if you look at platforms like Ripple even, uh, that's one that you don't think of as being a smart contract type platform, but there are tools that are being built for that and so that you can use that platform. So when you start looking at it over the landscape, smart contracting itself is starting to grow a lot and I believe it's going to be used a lot in the market. Um, as he said, for trust type of purposes, wherever you have to have two parties agree on something. And I'll just add a final piece to that is, um, I'm sure you guys heard of NEO. Uh, NEO is the, um, the Chinese version, they call them the Chinese Ethereum. Um, you know, so if NEO was created, of course, I, I can see that there's probably gonna be more similarities of the NEO type that is gonna be <coughs> created um, out there. So um, currently, um, you know, the crypto, uh, sector is obviously continues to evolve every day. Uh, I was speaking with uh, a gentleman um, that uh, um, I was mentioning that you know on Wall Street when I founded my two broker dealers and uh, um, uh, I became a self-made millionaire on there. Wall Street, you know, it moves fast, but not as quickly as the crypto industry crypto industry, um, every hour there's something new. And if you don't catch up with the news, you're literally falling behind. 
uh, and and of course there's real news and there's fake news. Uh, so you just make sure you follow the right one, and um, you know, and um, even I'm learning every day. You know, um, as as pros and professionals like us, we have to keep it up. Um, and I just wanted to uh, conclude with that. Yeah, yeah I mean, crypto is global, twenty four seven. Markets always open type game, and so I definitely have sympathy for you, Paul, because you're running a daily newsletter, and so you have to, you know, every every, every day and stay on top of it. Um, so, can you you've done a lot of work around you know, mobile money in Africa, around remittances. I think early on, remittances are kind of the obvious, you know, use case when it comes to blockchain, and so. What, what cryptocurrencies or what platforms uh, do you see best positioning themselves to be a kind of a, a dominated uh, player in, in how money moves in, in Africa? Um, so, I mean, Stellar was raised. I mean, we're building our platform on Stellar. Um, I think Stellar in particular has a lot of the functionality, sort of what I call like a, a pseudo bank coin, right? So Ripple is serving banks. It's the ability to kind of you know run tens of thousands of transactions per second, have a secure platform and system for exchange. I think the one distinction you have with Stellar is it's fully decentralized, and there's also the issue around access. Right? As long as I have the wherewithal to program on Stellar, the ability to afford you know, some a computer and have access to servers, I can stand up a node on Stellar, and I can begin to transact based on the rules of the, of the platform. So if you think about it from a democratic or democratized system, there's very little friction to actually access the platform and build and innovate. And when you sort of marry that with a lot of large informal economies where people are used to sort of peer-to-peer -peer transactions and having to be their own financial system, it makes a lot of sense. Um, so I think Stellar has a huge op opportunity and in particular they're philosophically also trying to solve the problem of, of providing financial services to the unbanked. Right, so when you think about the foundation and its efforts, it's all around trying to build and develop that, that marketplace. Um, so for me, I think you know, Stellar has a, a huge advantage in that place. Um, I think invariably the banks in association with Ripple also have a say because Ripple is trying to solve the same problem from the top down. How do you create less friction in international um, financial flows? And I think whatever cost savings that banks can yield from leveraging Bitcoin, um, sorry, blockchain as a better protocol, that would eventually accrue to their to their customers, the competitive environment. So um, I'm, I'm pretty bullish on those two platforms when I think about purely financial services. And I think on top of that, once you solve the financial, the core challenge of actually exchanging value, those platforms inherently also would accrue other solutions that are built on top of that, right? Because in any sort of marketplace, we have to be able to like exchange value. That's the fundamental need. How do I pay you for a service? But beyond that, you know, you can build platform systems. You know, I can create you know software that does particular things on top of that payment platform. So I'm, I, I tend to be bullish on the coins that are trying to solve so sort of like that banking marketplace problem um, because I think once they sort of get it right and have traction, a lot of value migrate to that because that's the fundamental the fundamental problem you have to solve is the medium of exchange first right yeah I completely really agree I mean you know I think they're both trying to solve it in different ways you know Africa the uh, the the reason there's such a, a big po uh, population that's unbanked is because the physical infrastructure of brick and mortar bank banking system just doesn't really scale very well when you have these rural communities but you know if everyone has a smartphone the, the cost of scaling that is much, you know, sure. the UNOC e economics actually makes sense. Um, so Josh, one thing I would love to hear from you, I know you uh, you actually just spent some time in, in Puerto Rico with uh, working a little bit with Brock Pierce, I believe. Um, can you tell us a little bit about kind of the, uh, or I guess what's happening with the, the crypto migration to uh, the Puerto Rico right now and uh, you know, <coughs> what's going on down there? Uh, where to start, <coughs> where to start. <laughs> so, it's a lot of the conversations we're having about uh, the needs in Africa are very similar in Puerto Rico. You know, power goes out. It's hard to access uh, basic uh, needs. It's, uh, it's really uh, terrible in many ways. And uh, it's been forgotten. Most people actually don't know that Puerto Rico 
is part of the United States. You'd be amazed at how many conversations I have with people, and they think it's a country, or that it's a part of some Caribbean syndicate or whatever they may think. And so it is a part of the United States, first and foremost. I think it's important to start there, right? Uh, but it does have very, very real problems where I'm seeing that blockchain, and it's interesting to talk about Stellar and Ripple, so you have you know centralized blockchain technologies versus decentralized and having the whole paradigm of thought and what it means to the solution sets. And, and that, that trust factor is really the protocol of trust, right? And so I think that's what Puerto Rico, Africa, a lot of these less developed uh, places, uh, we'll call them countries because Puerto Rico is not its own country, uh, those less developed places, they're looking for that protocol of trust. They're looking for that trustless system to exchange and transfer value and to have a, um, a unit of account that is, uh, is something that is also transferable amongst uh, multiple cryptocurrencies, which is really interesting. So there's a number of cryptocurrencies that have been uh, announced down there because one of the big problems, sorry, my, my uh, throat is parched. I flew in from uh, Mexico, then L.A., and just got in last night. So it's been a, been a crazy, uh, <clears throat> thank you so much, it's been a crazy uh, week. But one of the big problems down there is uh, getting cash at an ATM. When Maria hit, and for months, there were hundreds and hundreds of people all day, every day, like, and that's where you know, they need a better payment system. And so we have gotten so many restaurants and so many different entrepreneurs and business owners in the island to start accepting cryptocurrency. Because they're like, well, yeah, so I don't have to deal with cash. And when people come in, you're in the grocery store. Think about it. So we don't think about it here. In the grocery store, you got to pay. All of a sudden, the power goes out. And we're like, no, no, can't you pay with credit card anymore? Only cash. What do you do when you don't have cash? You know, you, you come up with cold storage solutions where you can transfer value through a, blo a trustless blockchain solution, right? Those are the kind of things that make sense. That's the kind of quantum leap that I think Puerto Rico needs uh, because they need basic real estate, infrastructure, energy, food. They import 90% of their food from California and then it goes to Jacksonville. Doesn't make any sense. So I think these are the kind of things that blockchain uh, technology is interesting and will help in in so many different ways. I've seen a uh, supply chain um, blockchain solution that is already using an existing technology solution, and then they're leveraging it with the blockchain. And that's the kind of stuff where you can take that and put that into an agricultural framework for places like Puerto Rico that used to overproduce agriculture before we turn it into a sugar cane production. Hmm. Awesome. Cool. So let's talk fundamentals. So uh, I think you know valuations in the space, while you know they've become, uh, we've been, we've gone through a bear market, and I think it's very very healthy. Valuations were getting a little bit out of out of whack um, back in December, or January. But I would be curious to hear um, all of your thoughts, opinions on you know how when you see a new crypto project, what what are your what's your criteria for for valuation? Like you. Is it primarily uh, you know, quantitative metrics you're looking for, or is your judgment of these projects more so qualitative and you know, a, a gut feeling kind of thing? I'll take a stab at that first. Um, well, basically, I'm sure most of us know right now that industry standard is, in terms of crypto, there is really no way to value a crypto at the moment because there there is no fundamental. Unlike Wall Street, there's no earnings there's no um, you know so basically when um, we buy sell cryptos we most of them of course we use technical trends um, and so I do a lot with my friends on on Wall Street um, when they try to value uh, these crypto companies most of the times they can't because the traditional method of valuing a crypto um, it's just not there you know so um, you know like Bitcoin and you know but of, of course I currently I follow only the top 10 uh, because uh, some of the um, negative effects in the crypto uh, industry these days are um, the liquidity you know uh, lots of people can come in and buy them but the minute when they wanted to sell them um, that's where they find the problem I have a friend uh, who bought in uh, $250,000 worth of Bitcoin at the peak, actually, when it was $19,000, right? It's hard. It's still beating like this. And, uh, you know, he's been holding on, and, and, and he put a sell order bits and pieces at a time, you know. And even, uh, you know, when he buy them, he can buy them. 
but when he tried to sell them, even as it's going down and he sells bits and pieces, he has a major problem, you know, doing so. So that's one of the things, of course, we talked about energy consumptions and stuff like that. So, um, you know, um, and then the SEC is going to crack down. We don't know when that's going to be. Um, um, I'm actually quite conservative in a sense that I'm waiting for the SEC uh, for them to say something because I believe that until they say something, um, Bitcoin, let's just use Bitcoin, um, they're going to have a resistance level. At, at, at the moment, I believe it probably wouldn't go past $10,000 um, from now to the end of the year. Of course, we, we, we can speak with other um, uh, bu bullish, uh, aggressive bullish, um, uh, like Tim Draper, he mentioned, what, uh, half a million dollars by 2020? Did anybody hear that? Yeah, it was quarter, 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 quarter of a million. 2022? Quarter of a million? Someone yeah. said half a million dollars. <laughs> I read it out there yeah, somewhere. Someone else. Later. Someone else. But, uh, but I'll leave it as that for you guys. Um, so I, I take a little bit of a different yeah. different view to valuation. I think, I think a lot of Wall Street does financial valuation, which I think is the wrong way to look at cryptocurrency, you have to take more of a venture approach, right? So venture capitalists value companies every day based on a promise, right? Yes, they're wrong. Well, I wouldn't say speculation. I think it's grounded in some level of rigor, right? So you're valuing a team, you know, do these guys operate in an industry where they have experience? I think that helps. You're valuing some previous track record. Have they done something in the, in, the, in the entrepreneurial space to make you give you an indication that, okay, they might be more likely to be successful. Um, I think you take the same valuation metrics or the same ways that you would value any entity trying to solve a problem. And I think you gotta take a market view into it. So when I think about cryptocurrencies, I mean, I first start with, you know, what's the problem you're trying to solve, right? In many ways, Bitcoin functions almost like a central store of value, like a central bank. Right, and if you look at the total valuation of the crypto market, it's about 400 billion today, um, which is nothing when you think about global financial markets. Right, so if Bitcoin is even vaguely somewhat successful in that it absorbs market flows from particularly unregulated markets where you don't actually have strong central banks, where you have, if you look at Africa, I think probably half the currencies in Africa are actually more volatile than Bitcoin. <laughs> Right, so for Africans, it's like it's par for the course, right? And you're dealing with governments and governance that's extremely weak. Bitcoin is actually very appealing because the trend line still looks like that, right? Not like this, where you're losing value in your deflationary currency, um, inflationary currency, like literally, in some cases, every hour, right? To the extreme cases like Zimbabwe. So for me, I think you, you, you look at the problem of solving, you try to figure out the market size, you determine if you know it's the right team, and you make some sort of guess as to five years, ten years down the line, do I see this entity having you know a particular sizable market share in a market? Right. I think that's fundamentally how you start. Um, I do think that you know decentralized systems, blockchain is a wave of the future because it takes away a lot of economic rent from a system. We've talked about that in a few panels today. You know, if I don't have to, you know, if you think about just world trade, there are a lot of intermediaries extracting a lot of rent, not just financial rent, but actually creating friction in markets where markets slow down because you have all these intermediaries making decisions. And wherever you're slowing down markets and slowing down the velocity of money, you're actually, you know, you're actually, you're actually limiting how fast economies can grow. So I'm a lot more bullish on the future, I think, of cryptocurrencies. Um, I don't think $10,000 is a cap by any stretch of the imagination this year. I think what's really happening, to be frank, from my point of view, is regulators are, are, are struggling with trying to determine how they can retain control of the system that is actually moving away from them, right? And I think the more and more use cases that show value, create value for the consumer um, emerge, I think the more and more you'll see adoption, the more and more you'll see the markets migrating to de decentralized systems. 
so let me ask a clarifying question. So when you say value, evaluating, evaluating cryptocurrencies, are you saying that from a just individual perspective, or are you looking at it for from someone who wants to invest in an actual project itself? So the project or the cryptocurrency? I would say, well, I mean, I, I guess you could take it however you want to take yeah. it. But I, I would say more so that the cryptocurrency itself. Okay. Yeah. So when I look at the cryptocurrency, um, and I've been looking at. Bitcoin since 2011. Uh, I stumbled upon it uh, by accident. Uh, didn't actually do anything about it until about 2012. But I take a much different approach to it because I come from the world of information curation and just listening. Um, I use a lot of that to determine what's really going on. And this is why I impress upon everyone, you know, strongly. Paying attention to the news can tell you so much. Now, I will say it's a lagging indicator because by the time it hits the press, it's old, right? And we already know that if, if there's going to be movement. But I will say that when you begin to look at the news, it does send a signal. Great example for right now where we are. The market was at the top of 20,000, nearly 20,000, right? And a lot of people won't believe this, but I actually talked to an advisor of mine that I had. And I told him at that point, I said, you know, I think this is going to be it. And he'd ask why. And it's a little bit of, if you have, have you anyone here read the book called Blink? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so it's a little bit of that. And, and rather people believe me or not, but I, 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 because I'm watching so much, I can't put my finger specifically on what it was that told me that. But it's a gut instinct that said that that's it. The pullbacks happen. And and if you would like to join my Facebook group, you can. But on there, I about, I'd say a month ago, I told everyone, um, oh, maybe it was a month ago, maybe a few weeks ago, I said 6,000, I don't believe we'll ever see it again um, this year. I said, I don't think we're ever going to see 6,000 again. And I read an article today where another gentleman said that he, don't believe, he doesn't believe we'll ever see 10,000. Once it hits 10,000, we'll never see 10,000 again ever, Right. Right now, the market sentiment in the news is extremely bullish. And if you don't believe so, begin to pay attention and just Google Bitcoin and bullish, and you will see everything from the big guys getting in, the institutional investors, the Soros, Rothschilds, the, Vin, uh, the Roth, uh, Rockefellers, to um, family offices are starting to consider it more and more. You look at what's happening with Coinbase, with custodial accounts, and with Gemini, with the block trading. When you begin to look at all the on-ramps that are beginning to be built right now and the pent-up demand on the buy side, there was an article that was published by CryptoSlate that said 92% of orders are on the buy side right now. When you begin to pay attention to the news that close, you will begin to be able to tell where the movement's going to happen. Now, I will tell you, everyone from Tom Lee to, again, you know, um, uh, of course, John McAfee's a little bit out there. But there are so many folks that are putting some wild, extreme marks of what Bitcoin can do this year. If you pay attention to that, it's my gut feeling again that I think that we're going to see some massive movements by the end of the year. Now, what happens? Will it go back up really big and come back down? Probably will. This is going to happen over and over again. I watched from 2011, the run-up, crash, run-up, crash. It's a popular YouTube video out there where a guy says, don't buy Bitcoin because you know it's going to crash. And if you've ever seen it, it's quite hilarious. But he goes time after time after time, and the run-up seem larger and larger and larger each time. I believe that's going to continue. So when I'm looking at any cryptocurrencies, that's one of the things I'm taking to play. Just like, um, and I, sorry, I forget your name. That's Cynthia, right? Jenny. Jenny, Jenny. No, not Cynthia. Yeah, that's what it is. Jenny. Just like Jenny said, um, I stay within the top 10 personally for myself. I always tell people top 20, you can probably, anything below 20, and it gets really, really scary. But top 10, there are a lot of solid projects that are there, and I think those are going to stay. Yeah, I agree. And I think, I think this next run-up is going to happen, when it does happen, it's going to happen much quicker because uh, during the last, um, the, the 20,000 bubble, I mean, you know, you had to, there was a delay with Coinbase, like they, you had limits, and now there's all these competitors of Coinbase, there's all these different platforms, and people are, already have their kind of limits taken care of and they're verified. And so once that run-up does start to happen, I mean, there's not, there's no, well, there's not as many barriers to that capital just... You know, water falling into the space. 
So one thing I want to talk about, one thing we touched on at the panel this morning is how U.S. regulators are, you know, there's, I definitely have some sympathy for them because they, the SEC kind of decides policies that the rest of the world follows, and so they, ha they do have a lot of responsibility on their shoulders. Um, but the U.S. has kind of grown up in this accredited investor environment, and this whole blockchain decentralized trend, um, you know, is, is in opposition to that philosophy. So I would love to hear from the panel what what geographies, what countries do you all see positioning themselves best to to be a leader in this space? Um, okay, man. Well, I was going to answer that a little bit differently. So I think every, it's, I think it's everyone against the United States. And, and I say it because if you look at post-World War II, the United States has controlled basically the world economy, right? And with China emerging as a, as a you know, after the Cold War defeated the Russians, the U.S. has had, I don't know, 30 years of unabated control of the financial system. Commodities are priced in the U.S. dollar globally, right? I mean, and so... You, I think what's happening now is everyone that has, has had to live under the ultimate power of the United States is potentially looking for a way to come away from that, right? So if you look at, you know, to answer your question more directly, if you look at Asian countries, I mean, the Asian Tigers grew under this post-World War II environment and probably for the first time in their, you know, advanced history are looking at potential opportunities to remove themselves from this sort of U.S. Um, polar dominance, right? Because the ultimate power the U.S. has is economic power over adversaries and even allies. And so if I can remove myself from economic control of the U.S. Central Bank effectively, then that gives me some leverage. And if you go all the way down to, you know, emerging markets that are essentially historically have been more used as points of extraction of value, if you look at Africa, Africa is basically subsidizing the rest of the world in terms of commodities, agriculture, because most of the value add for African resources are monetized elsewhere, right? So if I can kind of create an alternative path that allows me to sort of have more control of my destiny as a nation, and blockchain can get us there, then it's going to be, it's basically a free-for-all, in my view, of every other, um, you know, um, central bank, every other sovereign entity looking from some level of independence. And I think that's really the biggest threat um, and, the, and the biggest challenge. So my view is, I think Asia is a big marketplace. You've seen a lot of activity there and, and flows. But I think other emerging markets, if you look at what's happening on the policy level, even in a number of African countries, there are high level conversations around you know, blockchain task force and what solutions can they solve and how does it, you know, I mean, look at Venezuela. I mean, as, as bad as they botched, I think, that coin issue, it told you that Venezuela is trying to monetize its oil assets and have some level of independence and control over its future that is, to some extent, now subject to the whims of the U.S., right? So my view is, I think, emerging economies that are, are seeing the opportunity to kind of extract or retain more value for their resources and their output you know, are going to try and adopt this platform a, a lot quicker because there's, there's value to be gained from doing that. Um, I agree, uh, you know, with Akeem, right? Yes. Um, in terms of, well, you know, I, I guess I'm the Wall Street um, person on here. <laughs> so I guess uh, you can portray me like a Warren Buffett. He's very conservative and you know how he is not into even tech. He recently just got into tech and obviously he's probably like, years away from being close to crypto. Uh, but if we're talking about um, the SEC, because I've launched two broker dealers, I've dealt with Vendra, I've dealt with the SECs. Um, if you guys look at how the rules and regulations of the SEC just from last year for ICOs to this year, they've, li they've literally um, um, regulated a lot more in terms of ICOs, okay? Um, like Akin was saying, is that um, I agree that Asia Pacific is, is growing. I have businesses there, my partner is there. Uh, though at the end of the day, um, the United States is still um, the buying power. This is where all the money is. This is where um, 
uh, things are moving, this is where things are going to change, and this is where um, if things change here, everywhere around the world somewhat uh, get a dominant um, a domino effect from it. Um, you know, obviously there are a lot of bullish people out there. Now imagine in this entire room, if all of us are bullish, okay, then, you know, I'm probably the only bear, and there's reason why I'm a bear, um, you know, is because there's a lot of uncertainties. Now, if, if I forgot the quote that Warren Buffett always said, it's like, you know, if all the hurls run that way, he runs this way, right? What was that quote? Do you guys know what I mean, right? Yeah. Um, you, excuse me? When everyone's afraid, be greedy. When everyone's being greedy, Exa be afraid. Ex exactly, you know. And I actually tweeted this out. I believe um, this gentleman next to Akeem mentioned that he predicted the 19 was at the high. I actually tweeted that, okay? I tweeted, it's still on my Twitter page, that um, when I went up there, I, I tweeted that it's going to drop down to 10,000, 10, and it did. And when it dropped down to 10,000, I mentioned that my next target was five. Now, it hasn't reached there, but it was very close <laughs> recently, right? Yes. Very, very close. And I actually just tweeted out uh, just two days ago, yesterday, that I mentioned about my uh, $10,000 resistance. Okay, I'm just doing it this year. Uh, now, I probably did not follow crypto as, uh, as far as this gentleman here. Um, I've known about cri crypto way back in 2013, 14, but I really didn't get into it until like 2016. But if you guys look at how Bitcoin ran, okay, um, it literally didn't run past a thousand until last year. So my first tweet that I got in was de December of 2016. It's still on my Twitter. And I'm a Wall Street person. I tweeted that 2017 Bitcoin would double. Now, if you, you know, on Wall Street, that's rarely anybody, any analyst would predict that. You know, if any analyst would say, you know, this stock, Intel, IBM, Amazon, goes up 20 or 30 percent that's already a genius call for me to say bitcoin's gonna double the next year which is 2017 um you know no one makes that call but it did of course it went surpass a double it went to nineteen thousand dollars um but you know but if everybody in the room is a bull i i wouldn't mind being a bear you know um to average out and 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 you know and 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 basically um uh, we should you know um I mean, it depends on how much we invest in it, like individually, if we, we invest in like a small amount. But if, if we were to invest like a big chunk um, of, of money, then that's where the concerns are. Liquidity, you know, when you buy and then when you sell. Um, you know, so when I speak, I speak in overall, not from the perspective of the little guy, five or 10 or $25,000 worth of investment, but I'm talking more like, big manager hedge fund kind of a money uh, and and that's where um, you know the, the being conservative and being a little bit more reserved and not being you know way out there uh, is where my viewpoints and so uh, what well, and so are you saying that you think the US is going to be the leader in the space because we have all the hedge fund money that's going to flow into it well here here's where I predict okay I I, I predict that each current country even the United States, they're going to create their own crypto, okay? So if the United States create a USA crypto, what's gonna happen with all the altcoins? I'm not gonna say Bitcoin. I think Bitcoin will probably, we're gonna place Bitcoin in a, in a separate pool by itself, but all of the other altcoins, I mean, you already see China, India, they already banned the Bitcoin. The next thing is, any country say okay if their if their people their population is into this 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 coin currency thing, they want to make money too as a country, right? So if they create and then there's a second thing that I always talk about. What happens if IBM create a crypto, Intel create a crypto, Amazon create a crypto? All of the altcoins that we're investing right now, which I don't, if you know, I I I, I you know I hold some Bitcoin. Uh, what would happen to those altcoins? Now, if I'm going to put $100,000 of my money in Ethereum or Ripple or, um, you know, um, um, NEO, and then tomorrow Jeff Bezos comes out and says, you know what, we, we're creating an Amazon crypto. I would probably buy the Amazon crypto, 
because it's going to be backed by the company, which is fully financial on Wall Street. Now that next stage is going to come. Now I don't know if you guys going to, I don't know if you guys see that, but as a Wall Street person, I see that. Okay, everybody's, if, if you are in it for the money, if you're in it for the money, why couldn't a country like the USA or China or South Korea, I think there's a country already did that, uh, right? Venezuela. Right? Venezuela. Yeah, so, there you go. The yeah, you know? so Venezuela so, did. And I think, I mean, I think where you're, you're right is I think this is the first time that countries and governments and central banks face the innovator's dilemma that all of our large companies have faced for, you know, uh, you know, 20 plus years now. Um, Paul, so yes. you put out a daily crypto newsletter. Yep. So you're in the, you know, the yep. weeds every single day. Yep. What are you seeing in terms of uh, the, the countries that are making the headlines the most? Yeah, the ones that are making the headlines the most, uh, definitely Japan, uh, far and wide. Japan is making themselves become the place for blockchain, cryptocurrency as a whole. Um, outside of Japan, I will say this, that I think that a lot of countries that say that they will ban cryptocurrencies or whatever, I think they do so uh, not from the same perspective that we may think of it as. I think it's temporary. I don't think that it's a permanent ban like it's banned forever and ever. Uh, the reason some of these countries are, and some of the news articles have stated this, and I think some of it gets lost in the noise, the reason that they're making these bans is, again, for protection purposes. It's not like they're trying to ban it because they don't want it. They're saying they're banning certain things because they're trying to control the scams and people getting, you know, taken advantage of. And in an article I read today, it was saying that with better regulation, the more bullish that the market's going to become. Because if you're making the market safe, it means it's now time for institutional investors to come in. They know it's okay to come in because you have good regulation. But like I said, Japan is definitely one of them. Malta is trying to become a blockchain hub. Belarus is trying to become a blockchain hub. And I did have someone told me that while you might hear something in the media about one of these countries becoming friendly toward whatever it may be, the cryptocurrency, uh, be cautious because on the ground itself, it's not necessarily so. Um, so some of this does require a little bit more digging than just what the headline says and what the journalist has written. Um, but again, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely in agreement with them. I'm seeing in the Asian countries that the regulation is a lot more friendly. If, if any of you have launched ICOs or think about launching ICOs, some of those ICOs, they do go overseas to launch their projects because it's much more friendly or regulatory-wise than if they did it here in the U.S. because of the uncertainty of the SEC and not yet clear what we're going to do with making it a security or not. So, so just, just to piggyback on that comment, I have actually an opposite view. I think heavily regulated markets primarily protect incumbents because heavily regulated, I think most heavily regulated mar markets you know, are subject to this view of regulatory capture, right? So in the United States, you know, the, the financial system is heavily regulated. But in the last financial crash, you know, Goldman and all these bad actors walked away with, you know, a dollar for dollar. They got their money back on the, on the back of the taxpayer. I actually think that heavily regulated markets actually move slower um, because incumbents want to protect their position, whether it's financial incumbents like banks or even regulators themselves are trying to protect the control they have over markets. And I think that's going to stifle regulation, um, um, innovation in the United States. I think it'll allow other countries that are a lot more open, move faster in terms of innovation and actually solving problems. And I think you'll actually see a, a system, because at the end of the day, you know, money goes where it can get the most value. And globalization has basically killed this view that you can have a walled garden. Money will always flow to where it can get the most you know, the highest return. <laughs> mm -hmm. So my view is that you'll see financial, and on top of it, financial actors are extremely sophisticated, right? So, I mean, the apples of the world have been skirting U.S. taxes for decades. Nothing's happened to them. So my view is that value would flow to places where there's less regulatory overhang, where it can create value, economic value. That would accrue to the countries and domiciles that are more open. And that innovation will then reverse itself and come back to the U.S. eventually once large <laughs> solutions 
stock showing up. So I think that is inevitable. I don't think that the U.S. regulatory system is malleable enough to just quickly um, to, to stem all that loss of talent, of financial um, interest. And I mean, I do think that, you know, the, the way I look at it is look at the domiciles, even those are just, or not to your point, not necessarily, the ground doesn't necessarily back up the facts, but are, are saying the right things around how do we create an innovative um, environment to attract investment, to attract innovators, to attract solutions. I think those are the countries that are going to lead this next wave of development. Um, and I just don't see the U.S. I think the U.S. is in a long-term decline. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you guys some real data here, okay? Um, last year, can anybody take a quick guess in terms of how many billion dollars pump into the cryptocurrency hedge funds? $300 billion. Hmm. Right. I have, I have, no, it's only $2 billion. No, no, no. Um, no, no. no it's a lot more than that. Yeah. I think he's more, he's a lot, I think he's a lot closer than. Well, no, are, you, are you say, are you say capital flow into yeah. the hedge funds or into the markets? Into the hedge funds. Into the hedge funds. Talking about the hedge funds. Yeah, into yeah, the hedge just fund. the hedge funds. Yeah. Okay. So, so, um, so two billion, but this year in terms of hedge funds, okay, um, we're only at the end of April. We're already 50% of last year, so it's growing. Right, um, and the the United Nations estimated that the crypto market can reach 120 billion within the next few years. Now, here's the final data. Okay, the top locations of blockchain companies that raise venture funding in both 2017 and as of now 2018. Guess who's number one? The United States at 38 percent. Next is the United Kingdom of 29%, then Singapore, not even Japan. Singapore at 17%, then the fourth is Switzerland at 8%. So this data is out there. He's, he's the news guys there, but you know, those are some raw data. Um, regardless what it is, you know, um, um, I'm a believer of America. Okay, so, you know, I think, you know, I, again, I, ha I have businesses in Asia as well. The thing about Asia, there's a negative and a positive about Asia, is that while they are more flexible, you know, uh, of these new areas, because they don't have the books and regulations in place. Now, if you don't have the books and the regulations in place, true, the people can set up new businesses, new crypto, new this, easier, but it's also easier for such entity to be scammed, to be hacked, to be fraudulent, uh, for money to be lost, etc. You know, so uh, there's two sides to the coin. You know, and as a conservative person, you know, um, um, actually the twins, the Winklevoss twins of mm -hmm. Gemini, mm -hmm. they are actually really pro to help the SEC mm -hmm. to write the regulation. Am I right? Yeah, yeah. And do you guys know why though? Because they probably hold the bulk of Bitcoin, yes. <laughs> and they want to run for it, and they can't. So the minute if they wanted to sell it, they know they're going to collapse Bitcoin. So they're rushing, they're rushing the SEC to write the rule. So, you know, just like we're driving, you know, green, yellow, red light. So if there's rules, then the twins, the Winklevoss twins, could probably exit their money. I'm, they want to exit. You know, so those are a couple of things that as I'm not a real bear, you know, but I'm just trying to balance out this whole room or like he was mentioning, every news is so bullish. I'm, I'm trying to balance it out that, you know, there's two sides to a coin and just and just be a little bit more reserved, things, things through, because at the end of the day, it's your money is at stake. So let's do this. We uh, definitely want to make sure we have plenty of time for questions. And so let's finish off the panel with... Uh, telling us what is right now your favorite crypto project going on um, and why. You want to start, Josh? Well, I'm biased. Uh, EOS. Uh, you know, EOS being uh, built by Dan Larimer. Dan built Steam and the whole Steam blockchain protocols uh, that are out there that are pretty incredible. Uh, it's the most widely used and transacted on blockchain in the world. I think the uh, 
the potential possibilities for EOS are incredible. Uh, even being able to run blockchains aside from one another, and the whole liquid democracy <coughs> protocols that they've created for 21 master block producers. and It's a very uh, uh, delegated proof of stake, all that stuff. It's very cool. Um, I like it. It has a lot of utility, and I think that uh, from what I understand, there's more decentralized applications being built on EOS right now uh, than anything else out there. And I think the, uh, the flexibility of the blockchain uh, protocols that they're building uh, have real, real utility that will uh, create that transfer of value. Come real quick. So, uh, so Dan, Steemit, uh, BitShares, all were built in Virginia Tech uh, Corporation Center. Interesting. Of course, it's That's a plug you too. Yeah, just plugging that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, probably on, I'm a Bitcoin guy. I like Bitcoin. I, I stick with the Bitcoin project. Uh, it's the most, it's the longest running, battle tested for nearly 10 years. It's got the best developers, best programmers out there working on it. A lot of people don't understand. They like to freeze time and say, oh, but Bitcoin fees are too high. But then we had Lightning Network come in and reduce those fees. Oh, but Bitcoin's not you know, anonymous. I think that there are protocols that's going to be built on top of it that'll make it anonymous. Oh, Bitcoin's not XYZ. I think there is still a lot more to be developed with Bitcoin that a lot of people are not paying attention to that as soon as those projects come to market, Bitcoin will continue to be it. So I, I remain and continue to stay excited about Bitcoin. Um, I could pick two. But um, I think for me it's Stellar. I mean, I guess I'm biased as well. I'm, I'm building a platform on Stellar. But I think Stellar is trying to build essentially the centralized financial platform of the future. And I'm in particular bullish because I think they're trying to capture the majority of the world that's unbanked and doesn't have access to financial services. Um, so I think that's a big problem to solve. I think that philosophically um, there's alignment there. And I think in terms of just access, the ability for people from emerging markets to access the platform, build solutions um, that solve local problems, um, I think it's one of the more accessible platforms. And so um, if I had to pick one, it'd be Stellar. And uh, I'll, you know, like the gentleman over there, um, I'll stick with the king, which is Bitcoin. Um, I'm waiting for my $5,000 mark because that's where I wanted to come in <laughs> with a whole chunk of money. Um, I, I am a believer that Bitcoin can can go to the moon, you know, two or three hundred thousand um, dollars because I lived through the dot com era. Um, remember during the dot com era, there was pet dot com, piece of crap, piece, <laughs> tons of shit out there. And then there's Amazon, right? So if, if I were to cautiously compare the crypto industry now with a dot com, my Amazon would be Bitcoin. Okay, so, um, and then if, if, if I were to have a second choice, you guys probably gonna hear it here first. And if I'm correct, please make, make sure go to Twitter and you know, say Jenny said that. I believe that Facebook is gonna acquire Litecoin. Hmm. Mark it here. I'll, I'll, I'll write that. Yeah, you know. So I, I, you know, I, I believe because I believe that the the technology companies like the Facebook and the crypto industry, um, they're going to merge. Okay, um, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, Amazon can make one, Facebook can make one, Starbucks can make one, but instead of making one, they each gonna go out and say, well, you know, Facebook said, well, I like like, I'm gonna buy you. Amazon may like Neo, may like um, Ethereum, who knows? Um, we gonna see that and it's gonna be quite interesting, you know, when we gonna get to that stage, you know? So I don't know who's gonna buy Bitcoin it could be the United States of America kind of buy Bitcoin and that becomes the, the, the coin of the USA. Who knows? Anything can go, right? I mean, all, all these are wild cards. Yeah. What about yours? Um, I would say Neo. I love Neo. You know, I think it's a good project. And also, uh, you know, Neo pays you dividends for holding it on your wallet. So that's beautiful. But I will open it up for any questions that the room might have. Yeah, I have a question. Yes. Is anyone looking at uh, including insurance products 
as part of the platform for any of this? Mm. <laughs> well, so, so when you when you say insurance, you mean like insurance for like lost coins or? Uh, no, you know, insurance wrap, insure the value of the project or whatever, and, and lay, lay in the side of the I mean, so you know, you understand my question because we've done that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of people talking about it right now. Smart contracts are applicable to that, uh, but again, there's. And this goes back to what we talked about before. You know, this is an incredibly immature market, right? Like we're in at like you know a lot of us are crazy, okay? Like we're friends, we're frontier right now. Like this is insane, okay? <laughs> we can't go out and use our Bitcoin, Ethereum, or anything else to buy anything at the store right now. In most cases, unless we want to go online and use a retailer that accepts cryptocurrency. So let's just. Uh, admit to the fact that we're all a little crazy. So I think that's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, and so I think a lot of those uh, more structured or mature applications will come out as you see the market develop. And you know, there's a lot of implications there. I've, I've been in, in, I've been involved in a lot of conversations. I just had a conversation with Lloyd's the other day. Uh, so there is interest, a lot of interest, but everyone's trying to understand why is this blockchain better than this blockchain, and what's wrong with Bitcoin. You can buy options. I'm sorry? The Chicago Board of Exchange, they sell options mm -hmm. by putting calls on Bitcoin. That, that's not, his, his question is more of like using a smart contract, Lloyd's of London, reinsurance, you know, kind of a structure like that, or health insurance, PNC, you know, what are people looking at from that standpoint in order to add more value through the blockchain applications? But again, that's, that's a mature question for an immature market. Yeah. Uh, this market is only four hundred billion dollars, and there are no regulated exchanges right now. There are a few coming online. I have to be careful about what I say, but there are a few coming online where you will be able to trade asset-backed cryptos that are securities under private placements, follow Reg A protocols. I mean, there that is coming. That is getting. It's not there yet. Yeah. So we're we're still there's a, people want they they know that we can get there, but and, and it's happening fast. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is happening super fast. It's it the uh, I mean little, we go a week without reading. You know your 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 yeah. uh, your news brief here, and I mean we're behind. Yeah. You know, it's, Is it, uh, isn't Coinbase pushing to become a SEC related regulated exchange? Yeah, they've already made yeah. that announcement. One of the uh, groups that I advise uh, that has an incredible technology platform uh, that is built. Uh, it's not like it's a theory either. It's built. They're actually meeting with uh, Chairman Clayton today. Uh, so there, there's people that care about the future of this industry are influencing this industry across the board. And then to another question was asked that I'll uh, just comment on, because uh, when it comes to countries and stuff, think city-states, where everything comes full circle. So think, think city-states, okay? City-states are, they're, they're looking at this as a way for them to juxtapose leverage, okay? And so, and then their number one question always is, what does the SEC say? That's always the first question from anyone as we're talking about bringing these security exchanges online and creating a level of conveyance between city, states, and countries uh, to move uh, security instruments. I have noted that as the price of Bitcoin goes up, the price of almost all other alternative currents of uh, cryptos go up in Bitcoin price, which is counterintuitive. You would think it would go down. If the price of Bitcoin goes up, you would think it would take less Bitcoin to buy some of the other currencies. So what makes the whole market value go up? Does anybody have any thoughts about that? I mean, re really Bitcoin. I mean, Bitcoin's price is what really drives the vast majority of the other altcoins. But when you buy another alternative currency, you're selling Bitcoin. Right. Yep. So not, I'll, I'll, not necessarily. Yeah, I, I love to answer this question. Yeah. I was just on a call, <laughs> driving here with a family office, and wants to buy a gregarious amount of Bitcoin, right, uh, out of uh, both Hong Kong and Singapore. And so I think that what I gave them is, it's irrational, right? Like this isn't a rat. So just because Bitcoin's going up, the rest of the market's like, oh well, we should go up, right? And so it's there's no level. You you can sit there one day and think that something makes sense, and the whole the next day you'll be. You know, a little, a little kind of, well, this doesn't make sense right now, right? So I think it's that Bitcoin is, uh, what, uh, you know, over one third of the market, right? At one point it was, what, uh, when I first, what, over 90% at one point, now it's gone down, it's, it got down to 20 some odd percent. So it drives the market because it is a, the biggest chunk, 
right? And so uh, all the other altcoins are tethered to that to some degree. But they're priced in it. So they're so, automatically well, tethered and, and without so, well, their price and, in and, Bitcoin and, changing. And so yeah. that's where that's where you see a lot of pairs now right. outside of Bitcoin. So some of my best friends created uh, Tether, right? And Tether's been a big controversial thing because before Noble Bank announced their assets and we were in Satoshi Roundtable and it was a very interesting 200-person discussion, honestly. Uh, but now you're seeing more pairs being made outside of Bitcoin. So that's it's, it's creating Bitcoin where it's more of a store value and it's not necessarily a transaction or, 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 uh, or conveyance value, right? And so you're seeing those come out and there are more uh, stable coins and tethered type coins and cryptocurrencies that are coming to market to address those concerns. We don't have to have everything paired directly to Bitcoin. I think, I think part of the problem, just to add to that, I think part of the problem is, you know, the all, this whole market started off very speculative, right? Bitcoin, all coins, everything was speculation. I think as you see more and more actual use cases where coins actually are displaying real market or, or display real market value, where economic, economic activity actually is happening within an ecosystem, I think you see the correlations begin to fall off because you'll have some speculative assets, and you'll have some real coins that actually reflect real economic value, right? And I think that's when you're going to start seeing like correlations to Bitcoin sort of go all over the place, right? And I think the other issue too is the fact that, you know, to, to access most altcoins still today, you have to buy Bitcoin first and then buy an altcoin, right? So you might see like activity show up in Bitcoin, but it's not because I want to buy Bitcoin, it's because I want to buy something else and I have to go through Bitcoin. And so when you have more avenues to actually use fiat currency, like real cash, to go from cash to an altcoin, I think the relevancy of Bitcoin will begin to diminish more and more, and you'll see those correlations sort of fall off. Correct. Yep. Exactly. It doesn't compute for me. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, for, uh, so as we were talking about countries, uh, CZ moved uh, Binance to Malta, right? Because Asia is definitely a leader, but I don't think Asia is going to be like the end-all leader. Uh, they have uh, massive markets. But I think it's the city states again, uh, and I can't really say any more than that. And so you're you're seeing the you're seeing Binance. So Binance, you they're adding more and more payers. So before it was only Bitcoin, Ethereum, and I want to say Litecoin. Maybe were uh, paired to a uh, to USDT. USDT is Tether, right? And Tether is ba is, is is fixed one to one to the US dollar. So as you have more like Neo, that we mentioned earlier, and others paired to that US dollar, it makes the relevancy to Bitcoin, because then I don't have to convert to buy a particular altcoin, and I don't have to buy it through Bitcoin. So I'm able to transact through USDT right now, which is uh, which is paired one-to-one -one with the US dollar. And so as that moves, it's, but it's also driven by Bitcoin, but as more pairs come out, and they're paired to something that we're used to, which is a $1 bill, then we can relate to that. And I think that's why you're having trouble relating. And did I confuse you more? One more question. <laughs> so recently, there have been a number of things because of the the uh, the contracts are automated; they cannot be changed once they're being deployed. The so ones who find vulnerabilities in those contracts, they exploit them to steal the money. This is what Ethereum. That's why we have split the Ethereum. What has been happening in this field? Is there, what kind of a level of transparency do investors have into how these uh, smart contracts are being written and deployed, how safe they are? Uh, is there any self-regulation on, on, on the market regarding uh, contracts? Yeah, I mean, so I think it varies, right? So if you look at Ripple, Ripple serves the banks, and Ripple actually has the ability to reverse transactions. Right? And so Ripple operates in a very regulated environment with regulated third parties, such that they have more of a centralized system today, um, partially for those reasons. Right? So you can make a blockchain do whatever you want, it, frankly. It's, it's code. Right? So you have you know, permission blockchains, essentially like Ripple, that gives them a lot of power to reverse transactions to cater for mistakes. You have on the other spectrum blockchains where the rules are set. So if I make a mistake and transfer money to a wrong account, it's gone forever. I can't reverse that. So, I mean, what I'll tell investors is you kind of need to understand the nature of how each of the blockchain works or the blockchains work 
and the rules and make a risk assessment for yourself as to am I willing to take that level of risk around how the rules are set up. Um, but invariably, I think blockchains run the gamut from chains like Ripple that are essentially regulated to you know, chains that are very decentralized. If you make a mistake, send money to the wrong account. If you're careless with your secret key and someone finds it, you can get the value and you can reverse that. So yeah. I, I haven't heard of anything in the media yet about that, but I'm definitely going to be looking for it because that's a very interesting question about if there's a way to tell if a blockchain might have vulnerabilities in it. And that's something that I'm not sure if I have I think it's a, it's a question of like um, technical due diligence when you're looking to invest in the company. But, but, but the average person would not have the level of knowledge so, to be able to tell if a blockchain has but the a thing vulnerability is, well, like a well, contract well, flaw. Well, but, mo but to, to, to add to that, most blockchains inherently are actually fairly secure. When you hear of thefts, it's oftentimes because it's like thinking about it as a bank, right? The vault is secure. But if I somehow let you know my secret account number, and you can get into my account and take money out of it, then I was careless with my account information. The vault is still secure, right? So I think there needs to be a, a clear difference between understanding the nature of the blockchain inherently and the cryptographic security versus these layers of interaction that allow, you know, consumers might be, um, most of the time when you hear like, you know, coins get stolen, someone was careless with their account information, someone got it, like I, you know, I saved my account information on my email, it got hacked, so I got my account. Specifically referring to their yeah. weaknesses and exploiting right. the code itself, yeah. not so much as somebody stealing the private Correct. key. Yeah, like the DAO hack, and then there was a couple others that the same yeah. thing happened. It was something yeah. in the code mm -hmm. where developers went in, understood the rules, yeah. and manipulated and the manipulated rules them. to get the, and I don't remember which other one it was. It was Ethereum, and then there's another one that's out there too, but I know what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, this is one of the interesting, thing, interesting things that I like about EOS is they're building in security protocols into the underlying blockchain itself. Uh, and so I think it really does come down to a technical due diligence question, quite honestly. Uh, I think there are going to be social hacks and things like that where people are going to exploit uh, the way that uh, the offline world works, so to speak. But in terms of the technology, uh, I think, uh, again, we're immature, a uh, very, very immature stage. Uh, there's only a few blockchains out there that I think it built trust like Stellar, uh, quite honestly, at this point, because of your question and the fact that there have been some uh, unintended consequences uh, from some of the uh, open source nature sure. of this industry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's all we have time for, but definitely question. stick around for networking afterwards, and uh, thanks for listening.